Are you ready to screw the naysayers? Find out what I mean on today's episode of the Freedom Club Podcast. Welcome to the Freedom Club Podcast, where we discover the fight for freedom, fulfillment, passion, and purpose. Your host is Kurt Mercadante, Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, an agency founder who is dedicated to coaching individuals seeking to level up their life and their businesses. The Freedom Club is about unlocking your talents, turning them into strengths, and crushing your objectives. You can learn more at KurtMercadante.com. Welcome to the Freedom Club. Happy Hump Day, everyone. This is Kurt Mercadante, your very gracious host of the Freedom Club podcast. I hope you are having a fantastic week. And listen, before I get started today, I want to do some self-promotion. Today's episode, in fact, is brought to you by my upcoming 2019 Growth Mastermind. If you're a business owner whose revenue is great, but you're stuck in a rut, You think you're searching for work-life balance, which you've heard me say it before, that's total BS. But you need that alignment between your work, your family, and yourself. You feel like you're grinding instead of flowing. And you want to find and discover and achieve that true entrepreneurial freedom where you're not only growing your business, but you're also growing the freedom and fulfillment that you deserve in your life. Then I want you to Go to my website, kurtmercadante.com. Send me an email, sign up, fill out an application for my 2019 Growth Mastermind. It's limited to 15 people. It's three months long, and uh, I got some awesome people signing up for it. Listen, it's about accountability. It's about clarity. It's about discovering and using your strengths. And uh, everyone gets paired up with an accountability partner. It's going to be wonderful. We got weekly calls, hot seats. There's coaching by me. Uh, Again, it's three months. It's going to start the first or second week of January, probably the second week. Just that first week's always weird. So I invite you, go to my website, fill out the application. Let's get it started. Let's get you in the growth mastermind because it's filling up. It's limited to 15 spots. So grab your spot as soon as you can. Now for today's episode, I interview just a wonderful guy, Tim Allison. He is the author of a book called Screw the Naysayers. He's host of an incredible podcast. I was a guest several months ago called Screw the Naysayers. And we have a far-reaching discussion. We talk about everything about the educational system, schooling, coerced conformity, and of course, freedom. So without further ado, here is my interview with Tim Allison, host of the Screw the Naysayers podcast. Well, Tim Allison, thank you so much for being here. You had me on your podcast several months ago, and I'm so happy to have you here. Hey, man. My pleasure. So, Tim, the only set question I ever ask my, uh, my guests is, well, you know, this is the Freedom Club podcast. Yeah. And over the past year, I've asked all my guests, what does the word freedom mean to you? And everyone has their own unique you know, uh, slant on what it means, but there's also similar themes. So I ask you, what does the word freedom mean to you? Yeah, that's one of the easiest questions in the world for me to ask, uh, uh, because for me, it means freedom to control my own schedule. Um, And I say that, man, because when I think back to, you know, when I was, um, you know, a a young father, um, you know, with two young kids, I had a great job, Kurt. I mean, I was making fistfuls of money and, and poster, you know, we talked about this a bit, but poster child for, you know, for success and, and all of those kinds of things. But um, there were a lot of things, you know, wrong about that job. But the thing that was most concerning for me is that my kids were growing up as a, you know, without a father. And, um, and so, um, you know, freedom to me meant, you know, uh, being able to, you know, never miss a, uh, my son, a, a hockey game my son played in 13 years, you know, to, to all, yeah, I still travel for business and everything, but always, always knowing that I had the power to, to control, to, to come back, um, you know, and if he was playing, I was, you know, I was home. Um, freedom was, you know, being, uh, my daughter was really involved in a lot of school activities, volleyball, basketball, you know, drama, dancing and everything. And, um, you know, for daytime events, Schools need, at least in our community, they need volunteer drivers, uh, you know, and the freedom to say, okay, you know, guys, yeah, I'll take the minivan and load as many as we can get in there. And, and yeah, you can count on me. That, 
that to me was the thing that I was never able to put a price tag on. Um, and it truly, I think, you know, defines uh, one of my biggest purposes in starting my own business. So, you know, you said that early on, you were making the fistful of dollars, yeah. Yeah. but you didn't have that freedom, but you said you were the poster child for success. Yeah. Um, that word success is used a lot mm -hmm. and it means different things to different people. Do you think that the word success to, I guess, most of society, current society, equals what your and my definition of freedom would be? Well, no, because no, there's, there's never, at like growing up, there's never any particular correlation between the two things. I mean, I, I think, I think the word success and its meaning is, is, is starting to change. And, you know, certainly I see differences when I ask that question genera generationally on my, you know, my podcast. I think Gen Z answers that question different than some millennials, certainly different than like a lot of, uh, you know, folks like you and I with gray hair and gray beards. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but you see, the problem is, uh, is, 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 is when we're growing up, you know, we are basically provided a definite, at least I was, and, I, and most of the guests on my show that are honest about it, acknowledge that we're provided with a definition of success by well-intended people who want us to live a better life than they did. And these people are usually our parents. Um, you know, so regardless of how good their or bad their life is, every parent wants things to be better for their, you know, for their children. So, you know, in, you know if, if, um, if you, my parents grew up and actually, you know, as children were during the depression. So to them, scarcity of money, it was real, you know, therefore money was to be valued and, you know, your success was measured by, you know, how much money could you make? Uh, did you own your own home? Um, and there were other societal things, you know, my, my definition was pretty clearly handed to me, go to college, you know, get a good job, find a lady, get married, have kids, buy a house. And I never quite understood why the discussion <laughs> of success ended there as if life would somehow stop there. Um, but that's kind of what it, what it was. And I still think today that, it, you know, that like, look at the generations, look at all the millennials out there who were raised to think that success was about getting super grades and going to the best possible school and nailing the best degree and, and coming out and getting the, you know, a, a job on Wall Street or something like that. Um, without even thinking about, is that something you'd even be interested in doing? Right, right. And, and not even to mention the, um, I had, I don't know if you know Don Wetrick, but uh, he was on my guest number, guest number one on, on the Oh, street. he was. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Don and I spoke about it, you know, and he's, he's, I call him a guerrilla warrior, yeah. you know, innovating from within the, the bounds of the, the antiquated public education system here in the United States. And, you know, he brings up just the, the absolute, uh, well, here in the U S especially, um, the financial crisis that is about to absolutely explode. That's, that's all the, that's, that's on the investment side, right? Because every financial institution has their money or their, the, you know, their hands in the, uh, the student loan industry as it were. And when that bubble bursts, it's going to look, it's going to make the housing crisis look like a walk in the park, but there already is a, a, a the bubble has burst for those, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of students who bought into that definition of success and were told, oh, if you only go to the right school or if you only go to any school and get that college degree, that input, yeah. and now they're deep in debt yeah. or and the taxpayers are deep in, deep in debt, you know? <laughs> and people are telling them that it's not worth anything anymore. Yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's scary. We've definitely talked about that with, a, you know, not just with Dawn, a lot of the you know, the guests, uh, you know, my, you know, on my show have, have, have drilled down on that. And, it, you know, it, and it's, it's so much more than that, though, Kurt. I mean, the whole damn school system, if you think about one of the really nice uh, exchanges I had on, on LinkedIn, and I, uh, I can't, I want to credit the person that I can't remember, but, um, you know, we were just talking about all the things they don't teach in school and that we, we know all the crap that they teach that we never use. Right. Um, has anybody ever thought of teaching our kids how to meditate? Huh, interesting. Yeah. Now, Think about that, because how many people today find that, it, you know, that in order to, you know, to, to, to be uh, productive and to keep balanced and everything else and how important meditation is, eh? why the hell aren't we teaching our kids something like that? Yeah. You know, instead of forcing them rote memorization of facts that they can find as soon as they pick up their phone and Google it, you know, or a mathematical calculation of, of some formula that 
they're never going to have to show their work on how to figure out how to do this stuff because they never have to do it. Right. Right. No, exactly. It's, um, it's, it, well, and that's a big reason we homeschool our kids because we can teach them more practical things. My daughter, I had a podcast. She was a guest of my podcast uh, about her company she runs and she knows uh -huh. how to, you know, she knows that she puts money in the bank. She knows how to do that. She knows how to write proposals for clients. She's invoicing. I mean, those awesome. are things that, um, you just don't know. I mean, balancing a checkbook, you know, any of those yeah. things, those basic things. So what do you, you know, uh, st staying on this for a little bit, this topic, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, you talk to nine out of 10 people and the 10th person usually being a teacher, right? <laughs> a teacher who's not Don Wetrick. And they're all, yeah, there's a problem. They admit, oh, there's a problem with the school system. There's a problem with this. There's a problem with college. Yet, no one, if you ever even suggest making an actual change to it, yeah. Oh, don't do that. Yeah. It's 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 a really complex issue. One of my guests was a lady named Angela Myers. I don't know if you know Angela, but um, um, uh, she has the is the founder of the You Matter movement. You really you really should look her up, man. But okay, but yeah. uh, she made a you know she's a, as a teacher as well, but she's been advocating change in the system for you know for as, as long as um, as as she can remember. Uh, but she makes the you know the you know the 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 point that. Um, it's really hollow, as you say, for us to sit here and criticize the education system. If no, because it's our education system. That's what you're saying. It's our system. We own it. If we're not, if 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 society's not changing, we can't blame us. The system, the, yeah. the system is our system. We're the ones sure. funding it and not demanding change and all that kind of stuff. I know here the other thing, and I don't know whether it, you know this is just because I live in a smaller rural community, um, but the other thing that makes it really challenging is that uh, teachers, you know, people are very concerned that when they comment about challenges with education, that teachers will take it personally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really important, I think, to say that we need to be able to have educated discussions about the education system that don't imply that everybody that's in the education system is bad or doing bad things or because they're not. A great man, not all. You know what? There are some teachers that suck. Just like there are some podcast hosts that suck and some right. waitresses that suck. It doesn't matter what the profession is. That's always the case. Eh? But for the most part, I believe that the people that are working in our public education systems at the university or private universities, colleges, and in the, you know, in the school system are in it for the right reasons. Um, and they are doing their job and they are doing what they were told um, is what should be should be done, but it gets really difficult, you know, if you you know to speak up in a small community because if people take it the wrong way, you can actually create a very uncomfortable situation for your kids. Yeah. You get the freedom after your kids are out of the school system and you have less influence, you right. know. But uh, so I don't know, but I mean, I I just I just want to encourage everybody to to realize that if we stay on this little path, I mean, I just feel like when it comes to you know the education system, and I'll put it to you this way, man, it's not just the United States, it's not just Canada. This has been a topic on my show in New Zealand, in in Australia, yeah. in uh, you know in in Luxembourg, in France. I mean, I've talked to people all around in all around the world. And we're all basically doing the same thing. We are standing on the bloody train track and the light is bearing down on us at, you know, at 500 kilometers an hour, or whatever high speed trains can, it can do these days. And it's like, we're just standing there just waiting for it to smack. And like you say, the whole thing's going to implode. Um, it's, it's interesting. So I, you know, I worked in politics for many years and grew up and, and, and came up doing politics in Illinois. Now, Illinois is a state, which is a, a political cesspool. Um, I think some estimates, I don't know, it's anywhere between 150 uh, million or 200 million in debt. Uh, maybe it's even more than that. Maybe it's billion. Uh, I think it's more like 100 billion in debt. Uh, uh, most of that public sector unions, public employees. Uh, the, I have a friend who, who publishes some newspapers there and the amount of each dollar that goes toward that are going toward pensions for public university yeah. employees, many of whom are professors who never see a classroom and who make have side gigs getting paid 50 grand per paper by corporate America. But anytime, like in Illinois, anytime there's a whiff of change, yeah. the unions, I mean, they they you exactly. know take the day off and or bust you down to Springfield. But, but the problem is, and, and this is one reason I got out of politics, because it's not black and white. For the re same reason, you know, 
there's a lot of teachers who have been sold a bill of goods by the union that's supposed to be yeah, taking care sure. of them and they don't know any better. By the same token, uh, so that's on the left side, say, of the, of, of the aisle. On the right side, there's people saying school choice, school choice. And I get it and I understand it. And I know there's, there are very qualitative studies that have shown, okay, increase in test scores. The problem is, is that you're rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now let's make, the, let's make the chairs nicer on the Titanic, but you're yeah. still in the militarized school system that yeah. was basically developed based on the Prussian military when you had, you know, you needed factory workers. Yeah, that's right? exactly. We still have the same exact system. So yeah, no, it's exactly, exactly what it is. There's a really interesting uh, experiment underway and in, uh, with private and public sector partnership in New Zealand. There's a, mm -hmm. uh, a guy by the name of Rich Rowley and the, it's, um, oh, oh gosh, name of his company's uh, just escaping me, but uh, he was one of, one of the early guests on my show, but they, uh, the, the mind lab, uh, something like that. Anyway, what they've done is they've created these little, um, mobile learning centers. And last year they put through 40,000, it's a private sector company, but they put through 40,000 elementary age kids went, took time off school to go out and go into these, these labs for you know a day or two or whatever. And they would go, Kurt, thinking that they were all excited because they were gonna get to work on robotics or something. It's all different and new. Um, but you know what, what uh, Rich was just chuckling, he says, well, it, it's true, they are working on something sort of related to robotics, but that's not what we're trying to teach them. <laughs> they put them in groups, there's like multiple groups. The teachers aren't called teachers, they're facilitators. Hmm. Um, and, and basically they've got to figure out how to, to do something. And if they can't figure out a step, they put their hand up and the facilitator will go over and, and but if I say, you know, Mr. Mercadani, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Well, Mr. Mercadani's gonna say, well, um, the group over there in the corner seems to be a little further ahead of you. Why don't you get up and go over there hmm. and ask them? Yeah. And so they're learning about collaborative learning. They're learning about not individual test scores because nobody's going to be perfect at everything. They're learning that if, if, if I'm good at the, you know, you know, figuring out what we need to do, but these hands are clumsy in terms of putting it together, but you're good at putting it together, that maybe we ought to just cooperate and get this thing done so it works and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, this, these are the changes that are going to have to take place. And, and you know, another issue that is, is uh, it's controversial as hell, but I just, I, I'll put it out there because we have school systems being inundated with, with, with people being put on special programs because of special needs and everything. Um, and um, we're attributing the fact that they need that special programming to the fact that they they have some learning disability. I'm not quibbling with what learning disabilities are. There are, you know, I'm not sure. saying that they're not real, but I'm saying that a lot of the things that people with these, these learning disabilities appear to be struggling with, like sitting in a chair all day right. and having to just listen to rote repetition, everybody struggles with. So yeah. instead of just trying to, you know, dumb down something for a group, why don't we take the bigger issue of what we're trying to teach and find out how to teach it so you can get up off your butt and you can talk to people and stop trying to convince me that you're smarter than me or I'm smarter than you because there's, there's not a, quality, a true quantitative measure of doing that. I refuse. I don't believe IQs do that. I don't think there's any real way of for the nice analogy that I'd like to give as a father is this man. I got, I have two kids. They're both in their thirties now, but I mean, growing up, my son struggled a lot in high school. I mean, you know, he, um, didn't do well with tests. He hated being timed on things and stuff like that. Um, but you know, today he's an electronic technologist, but I'm telling you flat out that if you need a problem solved, he's the guy you're going to turn to. Now, my daughter, who's was a, you know, very successful entrepreneur these days, social media strategist, um, but was academically really, really, really smart. So people would have said, well, Denise is smarter than Jonathan. Well, and I ask him in this scenario, let's say you and Denise and Jonathan are in a room and you have just been, and it's locked, and you've just been notified that there's a bomb that's going to go off in the next 15 minutes. Which person are you going to ask to try and get you out of the room? And I know who the hell I'm asking, and it's not the, you know, the lovely daughter who I love because I just know that Jonathan's mind is going to go to that kind of a problem, you know? Yeah. And We've got to start respecting people like that, and we've got to start creating work environments for people like that. One of the reasons so many people, I was talking to a guest on my show today, it was a scene of fact, one of the reasons so many people are opting out of the workforce and gravitating towards entrepreneurship is not that they really want to run their own business. It's just that they, they're just tired of being disrespected, and they're tired of being asked to do things that they're not good at doing yeah. and being told you just have to work harder. 
Well, sometimes working harder at something you're not good at just makes you even more fun most times. Yeah, you know? and, and a lot of these workplaces, I mean, it's just like the school play, uh, this, you know, schools is that they pay lip service to engagement or employee engagement. So they'll have, they'll have parties, um, you know, or give employee of the month plaques yeah. without yeah. actually, but then everyone is judged on arbitrary BS inputs, yeah. just like in school. So you're judged on whether or not you can sit there for 45 minutes in a school without getting up and having to go to the bathroom, without doing these things. It's the same at work. I had a, a client who would have their HR manager in the morning go door to door of the offices of the vice president and cubicle to cubicle to see if the administrative staff was there to make sure that they were in their seats at 8.30. And it's like, these are VPs making, I don't know, two, three, four hundred dollars thousand dollars a year. And so we're not judging people on outcomes. We're judging them on inputs. And your point about the special needs, uh, Dr. Peter Gray has a book called uh, Free to Learn. And he talks about that. And I can't remember the statistics, but it's, it's very troubling in the amount of kids who are labeled as ADHD and the label comes from the teacher. They're put on medication. Yeah. And the main reason is they can't sit still. Now, I know, we, as I said, we homeschool our four kids. Uh, one of my sons would be unable to sit there for 45 minutes. Yeah. He's probably at the genius level. I mean, he's a t I, I'd say if we gave him the materials and enough money, he would build the Iron Man suit like tomorrow. And he's like 10. And so, but in school, he'd be labeled a problem. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's just not, listen, like you said, there are kids out there who, who need help, but we're doing it. We're applying it now. All of a sudden, everyone's ADHD everyone's this or that and everyone's like oh there's an increase in this no there's an increase in the diagnosis based yeah. on nothing other than you can't sit still and and, and adhere to arbitrary arbitrary inputs yeah yeah, so. yeah. no it it um, you know it's it's a system that uh, but you know I, i'm kind of with the you know back to what you were talking about i mean i, I don't I, I really try to be an optimistic person, man, but I, as much as I hear this discussion <laughs> taking place, I don't see much in the way of tangible uh, change. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, at 60, instead of just, I was going to retire, Kurt. I mean, you know, now, as you know, I'm, we were chatting before we went on the air, I'm working pretty much full time on a podcast, uh, just <laughs> for the sake of being on a podcast, I guess, but, but not really, because I really started to get angry. Because what I don't like about the system right now is that, you know, your kids are going to be in, in great shape. You're homeschooling them. My kids grew up in a home with an entrepreneurial father who had walked away from it all and said, piss on you. And, you know, I like money. I like it a lot. Thank you very much. But I'll never be a slave to it. You know, right. and they learned about, you know, uh, whether they realized it or not when they were traveling and I took, they've been all over the world. Um, the words come out of their mouth every day that remind me, oh, you actually heard something when you were in sure. St. Petersburg, Russia, or, you know, or, or, or whatever. But what's really so unfair about that, man, is that the vast majority of the kids that we have in our system are growing up with well-intended parents who so desperately want them to, to have a better life, and they're giving them the best advice possible, and the advice they're giving them is making it worse for them. And nobody's trying to help them. And, and, and the, you know, when I started talking about it, and I still haven't quite figured it out, how to make this a sustainable movement in a sense. But when I started telling people, you're, you know, you're a coach, and, you know, and when I started telling fellow coaches, because I was a business coach for 12 years, but when I started telling fellow coaches, I wanted to try and help late teens, early 20s, you know, so they didn't have to go through all of the pain, you know, that, that I don't like the idea that so many of the guests on my show have had heart attacks or their families have broken up and they've had unnecessary divorces or, you know, or ended up in the hospital or, you know, or whatever. And almost all of them just chuckled at me and said yeah. uh, something along the lines of, yeah, you got to wait till they're 30 or 35, then they've had enough pain, they've got enough money put aside, and they're willing to pay you. So I translate that in my little mind to mean, oh, well, we should just write off everybody in there, you know, between the ages of 18 and 30. And after they've been screwed around enough, we should try and do something about it. And I said, damn it, I don't know exactly how I'm going to impact this, but I'm going to try. You know, and, 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 um, and, and that's what, you know, what, and that's what the show like this is about, but that's my mission is that sure. we've just got to stop writing off generations and we've got to start getting to them earlier and, and helping them figure out what their definition of success is. And for God's sake, stop telling them what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like to call it coerced conformity where everyone just moves in the same direction 
And if you even suggest, I mean, we'll have relatives who, you know, they'll ask my daughter, my 12 year old daughter, well, what do you want to, where do you want to go to college? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I want to go to college. I want to be an artist or a writer. Like why the hell would you go to, and, and it's like, what, what did you say? Yeah. You can apply that to a number of things, but um, I hate the I hate the words like people are sheep, you know, because I don't like to insult people. I think just people people get into their comfort zone. Yeah, they're told, yeah. you know, what to do and how to do it. You know, we I think we as a society, probably everywhere, certainly here in the United States, are outsourcing more and more of our sense of responsibility, our freedom, our, even our, our sense of happiness yeah. to politicians, to the government. Where we have now three years later. People who are still, there was a, just a study done, still in psychological trauma from the election of 2016. Yeah. It's like, what if we ever had a war? My yeah, grandfather's, my grandpa had shrapnel in his body yeah. for He knows what, what trauma is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you, you decided to, to do something about it. You have the book, Screw the Naysayers. Yeah. You have your podcast, Screw the Naysayers podcast. So tell us a little bit about that. It, it's well, you already talked about the impetus to do that. Yeah. Tell us how that's going. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to, man. So the first thing I would say about the book is that um, your daughter is, uh, is if she's uh, anything like you is probably at the right age to read this book. Okay. I actually, or maybe just a little bit on the young side, but I actually wrote this book because uh, there is a little language in it and you'd have to decide whether it was appropriate. <laughs> uh, but I wrote this book for teenagers. I mean, I truly wrote it, and, and when it hit, uh, the, the, one of the highlights of my professional career is when it, when it hit uh, Amazon bestseller, uh, but in the category of children's books, careers, um, because I spent a long time trying to figure out how to frame a message about all of the stuff that you've been hearing um, uh, from people that love you, and how to politely tell you that there's a good chance that a lot of the crap you've been hearing is not right. Um, <laughs> So now there's some honesty in it. There's some honesty about the problems that, that I had in my workplace. So 12, you know, maybe 14, I don't know. Um, but I do talk about, you know, um, the impact of being overstressed in work and how I started to abuse alcohol and those kind of things. But the fun part, the satirical part, the, 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 is, is I have all these chapters that's written in the language. Um, um, like, for example, to use your analogy about that, that question about what do you want to do is uh, yeah. there's a whole chapter in my book called The Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> And it talks about the different types of people that are going to ask you that question, how their motivations vary. So like loved ones are asking it, you know, in certain ways because they want the best for you. And, um, but two other things are happening here, both with loved ones. And you also get this questions from when my daughter went for a driver's test at like 16 or 17, the driving instructor asked her what he, she was going to do. And she told him she was going to go study political science. And he, who's never met her in her life, says, that's a bad idea. You should study business. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so everybody's got an opinion. So, but, right. but, but the thing about the people that are around are the children is that by the time they're in their early teens, certainly by the time they're 15 or 16, people have formed conclusions about what they think this person is capable of mm -hmm. and where they actually see them fitting in, in, in society. It's, I, I guarantee you, man, that's exactly what's going on. And so loved ones are asking to make sure that you're shooting high enough. You know, they, cause I'm telling you what, like if they've got you pegged as being doctor, lawyer type stuff, and you say, I want to be a dog walker, you're going to have some interesting discussions with, you know, with family. And by the way, what does that teach our kids to do? To not be, not answer the questions honestly. Cause right. after being, you know, put through the inquisition four or five times, they realize it's easier to just lie. So it's either, I don't know, put it off or, oh, I'm going to go to college. I'll, you know, maybe I'll be a doctor or something and never having any you know, particular intense, but it shuts down that communication. All these other people outside you that don't know you that well, but do know you, they're actually checking to make sure that you as a parent have done a decent job of raising your kids because they have it in their mind and they want to make sure you figured out where you fit in society. Everybody's supposed to have a place, you know, in, in that ordered society you're talking about, which is a natural outcome of this, this uh, compliance-based education system. Everybody's supposed to have this place. People want to make sure that you know what your place is and they drill it into your head. So if you're either that dog walk, you know, the, the, the brilliant person that everybody thinks should be a doctor that wants to be a dog walker, or if you're the guy that they think is, well, you're never going to, you know, amount to anything other than, you know, working in a field somewhere. And yeah. you say you want to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a micro uh, biologist or something like that, they're going to tell you you're an idiot too. And these are, in my words, is, is the, 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 the most dangerous kinds of naysayers 
that you know that are out there. So the podcast is about talking about stuff like this. It's about talking with with people that have faced adversity. I've I've actually attracted. Uh, it's been interesting because a lot of my guests are people that have faced tremendous trauma, real trauma. Um, you know, um, but have not only overcome it, but have have found a way to see that adversity as as not something that they you know that they went out and attracted, but because it just happened to them in that case, these cases. But they, they found the good in it, and they found the blessing in it, and here are the lessons. And so they'll talk, Amy Lore will talk to people about, and to corporations, about purity of intent. You know, and that, you know, if you want to be successful, whether you're a one-person business or a mega corporation, you'd better understand something about Gen Z that's coming up here. Purity of intent is going to define whether you're still in business in 15 years from now. Because those Gen Z, they're the people that are going to have all the money in about 15 years' time in terms of the consumers. They're going to have the kids and the families and all this kind of stuff. And if they have lo lose trust in you, they lose trust in your purity of intent, you're not going to get it back. Hmm. They have no big brand loyalty. They will tie. They don't care if. It, in fact, they kind of like the small person that they who do they can trust and all that kind of stuff. And so we talk about all sorts of different things like that. And then we talk a lot about how you, um, you know, how you develop a mindset to overcome limiting self beliefs. Because I, I think, I do feel we 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 share a belief that we live in a world of abundance, um, and that there's lots for everybody. You know, you know, uh, out there. The thing that the people that I'm most relating to, Kurt, is is that, that there's there's a a crisis. I'm going to use the word crisis. I think it fits here, of limited self belief in people. You know, 30 years in age of under. There's just so many, not in everyone, but there's just so many of them that have been made to feel that that they can't live the kind of life that they want to live. And it's having devastating consequences. Like we've got an, almost an, half of an entire generation of millennials, I think, fit in that category, that are are lost, you yeah. know, and that they, their jobs they hate, they don't feel, they don't have a choice, they will tell you, because they've got all this debt and they've got to make money. And if it means working four different part-time jobs or whatever to do it, and even if they get a job that they thought was what they wanted to do, it turns out, yeah, I'm making money, but it sucks. And, 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 and so it's just each and every day I want to have conversations with people that will expose the lies that, you know, that says it doesn't, it's not about motivation. I'm not trying to say somebody's harming us on purpose, but you know, things can't continue. We've got to be asking people, what is it you really want in life? What are, what's important to you? What do you value? And damn it, don't let people tell you that if, if that, if for me living in Nova Scotia and being a present parent meant more to me than money. Yeah. Lots of people told me I was a selfish. They, they played dirty cards. I mean, the reason I moved to Nova Scotia and started my own business was so I could be a present parent. I, I felt I'd made a huge sacrifice in walking yeah. away from this career. The card that everybody played was you're an irresponsible parent. You're jeopardizing your kid's financial future. You'll never get this chance again. You're a bad person, Tim Allison. <laughs> you know? It's amazing. People, um, I had a post on LinkedIn uh, in September at some point, and we were at the beach on Wednesdays. Um, you know, my wife, takes a day off because she, she homeschools the kids. And I take the kids on Wednesday and she goes and does whatever. I mean, yeah. whatever she wants to do. So I was at the beach. So I did a video on LinkedIn. Hey, I'm at the beach on a work day because I, I focus on my outcomes. This is an outcome I want, but I got my work done today. And you know, the, the vitriolic responses I got, um, you know, one guy quoted Psalms Oh, because really? in Psalms, listen, I've read the Bible cover to cover, but I don't remember. Apparently there's a specific verse about men shall work 80 hours in the, in, in the, or eight hours a day or 40 hours, whatever in the fields. And I was like, I think, I don't think that's a requirement. I don't think that was like a requirement. Um, and, and other people, oh, that's irresponsible. Why are your kids at the beach? Where's your wife? What are you doing as a man? And it's like, okay, well, if you define being a man, as never seeing your kids yeah. and, you know, being miserable and setting a bad example and then putting your kids on the path to financial ruin and lack of fulfillment. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm not being a man. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I, I, there are people who in any other context will say it's not polite to talk about religion or politics. Yeah, I've had people, we just tell them we homeschool and they tell us that's, that's bad. That's irresponsible. That's, you know, what about the socialization? Their number, what about prom? What about this? It has nothing to do with success and fulfillment and have, leave it, leading a life of, of true success. But it's, it's um, but what about the socialization? I don't know. What about the, you know, 
the suicide rate, the alcoholism rate, the drug use rate, the depression rate, uh, all of that in any given school. And I'm not saying that take your kids out of school, but my point is, we'll do us, you do you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, these are, these are, are, that's also sort of, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, these are extreme examples you gave there, but it's part of that naysayer culture too, though, because our society is filled with people that have settled. You know, that yeah. they've, they've forgotten how to dream, Kurt. They don't believe anymore. And we all, we all are born, you know, uh, with the capacity to believe, but it's been, it gets beaten out of us. And unfortunately, with, with a lot of people, with, with a lot of naysayers, when they've, when they've have lost that ability to dream and they're living a life where, if they were really honest, they won't admit it, but they're miserable. You yeah. know, they're not happy. And so if that's, if that's happening to them, then... Um, the fairly natural reaction is they don't, when you sort of challenge the authority and say, well, it is possible and they don't want to accept that. So therefore there must be something wrong with you. Right. Right. And, right. And the problem is that we sort of stand out. Like when I did, you know, when I made my move, it was 30 years ago, people did not quit. I, I was in the top 2% income earnings in the country of Canada, you know, and I was 31 years old. I mean, this, you know, you did not quit a job like that because you said, well, I really would rather live in this fishing village in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I'm going to start a, a software company, an educational software company with no products and, and no customers. Oh, and by the way, the internet doesn't exist yet. We did have this new fangled tech, uh, technology called a fax machine. <laughs> and, I, and I was able to buy that for $2,500. I got myself a fax machine. It did include a cassette tape a telephone recorder too. So if you wanted to leave me a phone message, you could do that too, you know. Everybody's, you know, I mean, I mean, I could have filled the province of Nova Scotia with people that would have said I was kooky. It's way more in vogue now to, you know, to step away and, and, to, and to decide things are important. But, and I don't advocate, I'm not saying everybody should move to the country. I know people right. that love living in cities and sure. I think all the more power to you. I just advocate for me, my definition of success that it took me 30 some odd years to get to, but I'm, it's now concrete for me, is simply being able to live a life that aligns with the things that I value. And if I can say that, that I have for the better part of my adult life, lived a life that aligns with the things that I value. Sometimes we're tough, sometimes we're good. You know, I mean, that's, that is life. But um, um, I'm content with that. And, you, you know, you, you'll know this as, as, you know, I think I'm older than you, of course, but as, as years pass, the way we look on happiness changes. There's been an amazing study that was done at Stanford University. I can't remember the woman's name, but she talked about the stages of happiness and the way we perceive it. And what happens when you get up to my age, I'm 61. And when you get, it's not always tied to a specific age, but there's stages we go through. And we get to a stage of life when a lot of our happiness comes from looking in the rearview mirror. Hmm. You know, we, it, 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 it does get to a point where you look back and you say, all right, am I, did I live a life that if it ended today, I could say, I was content with, that there were more things about it that made me feel good. But everybody screwed up. Everybody has something that they wish they hadn't done. I've not met anybody that <laughs> sure. they have right. as a liar. But that in general, you can look and say, you know what? You know, I, I really did focus on the right things and, and, and all those kind of things. And, and, uh, and so the crisis that we, you know, we have with younger, younger people is they're still caught in the stuff you talked about, the employee of the month thing, that's just a continuation of external gratification, external validation like grades at school. So what do the employers want to do? They want to make, make people, they don't want to give them any more money, but they want to make them feel like they're, I know you hate the job, but you're so good at it. So Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> ah, you, know, you, you should flip hamburgers for another 10 years because you're just awesome. Right. You know? Uh, right. I, mean, I, could, I know with time's limited, I could go on, on on this one for, you know, forever. But I would check that out, stages of happiness, Stanford cool. University. Um, you know, because it, it, what we do is we move from, from external validation to start asking about more about, you know, purpose. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, why am I doing this? What am I, you know, what am I doing this for? Sure. Um, you know, so making money isn't a good enough reason to do something, making money, doing something that we believe in that kind of stuff. And you, so we move through these, you know, these, um, these different stages, but unfortunately there's a ton of people my age, there's a ton of people who will be my age in the not too distant future. When they start asking that question, they're not going to be very happy when they happy look in that rear view mirror. And it's going to be the kinds of people who are writing those silly notes to you about, about taking your kids to the beach. Well, Tim, if someone is listening here and they don't want to get to that point and, they, and you've rung a bell for them, 
where is the best place for them to find you? The yeah. Book, the podcast, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So really the, the easiest place to get everything is, is uh, and I still love saying this one, Kurt, it's www.screwthenaysayers.com. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, the book's on Amazon. You can definitely get it there, but you can also get it, um, you know, on, uh, on my website. And uh, my contact information is on my website. The podcast is hosted on the website. It's also in all of the standard, you know, places, iTunes, you know, Spotify, Google, Lost Stitcher, all those kinds of places. I love in interacting with people. Um, I love engaging with people. If people, um, if this message resonated and rang the bell and they want to talk, then I would just so encourage people to reach me out and my, reach out to me. My contact information is there. And I'm also on LinkedIn, as you know, uh, sure. great deal. just Tim Allison. It's Allison with one L. Uh, and uh, yeah, love to, love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Tim, for being on the show. I, I, I love being on, on your show. I was happy to have you here. And uh, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks, Tim.